Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2010 uh, Arthur W. Fisk Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'm Jonathan Anton, um, and it is a little sobering to think, especially looking at my retired colleague Mel Derschlag out there, that I am now the senior faculty member in constitutional law uh, <laughs> here. Um, <coughs> And I'm uh, delighted that this year's uh, Fisk Lecturer uh, is to give him his full name as it appears in the program for the one and only time, uh, William M. Carter, Jr. Uh, I will have a little more to say about Chip in a, in a minute, but let me just uh, say that the, um, the Fisk Lectureship was established more than 20 years ago uh, to honor Arthur Fisk, uh, a 1931 graduate of Adelbert College uh, and a 1933 graduate of, the, of this law school. Um, now, this lectureship has uh, attracted uh, some extraordinary folks, and, and, and I think that Chip Carter is a, is a worthy addition to uh, a group of lecturers that uh, includes uh, Fred McChesney, uh, who's at Northwestern, um, Jonathan Macy, who's at Yale, uh, and uh, Martha Minow, who's the new dean of the Harvard Law School. Uh, I've known Chip for a long time, and uh, to be honest about it, this is about as good as it gets for a teacher, uh, to be able to introduce one of his all-time great students who has uh, gone on to uh, an extraordinary career in his own right. Uh, I met uh, Chip during his first year of law school. I think I sat next to you in property uh, one day when uh, my colleague Laura Chisholm asked me to come sit in uh, as the class discussed a case about which I had written. Um, then I had Chip uh, in my First Amendment class uh, and to say that Chip broke the curve would be an understatement. Uh, he carried the discussion the whole semester in a very good class, I might add, uh, and uh, he wrote uh, one of the best exams I've ever gotten from a student uh, in any class. And for that reason, uh, uh, Chip uh, made a big mark not just on me, but he pretty much performed that way uh, across the board. Uh, and so when we had the opportunity to bring him back as a colleague, uh, we jumped at it. And in fact, uh, uh, Chip has done some extraordinary work on civil rights and constitutional law issues, including some work on the 13th Amendment. Indeed, it has occurred to me that perhaps uh, the law school might uh, might try to figure out some way to violate the 13th Amendment by uh, simply keeping him here and not uh, letting him leave. Um, but, um, okay. Um, today, uh, Chip will be talking about uh, affirmative action as government speech, uh, a First Amendment analysis of the colorblind principle. Uh, I've gone on too long. Uh, let me turn things over to Chip for what I'm sure will be a very stimulating discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, a couple of things before I launch into it. The uh, first problem with an introduction that kind is that the speaker is expected to live up to it. Um, so next time, maybe ratchet down the expectations a little bit. Uh, secondly, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say how honored I truly am to be here as a, an alum and former faculty member of this school to be invited to give this lecture is truly a great honor. Um, there are few things, though, that are more nerve-wracking than giving a paper about constitutional law in front of your former constitutional law professor. So I'm going to try to pretend that Jonathan's not here and dialogue with the rest of you. Um, one other piece of rhetorical throat clearing. I, I think it's worth mentioning that it's uh, somewhat apropos that I'm giving this talk on the first Monday in October, which, of course, is when the court convenes its new term. <coughs> Excuse me. And I don't mean to be unkind to the justices on their first day back at work, but I'll be uh, launching some broadsides against their jurisprudence with regard to race. So hopefully no one will tell them. 
The paper on which this talk is based has dimensions that are doctrinal, normative, uh, and descriptive. And what I mean by that is this. The descriptive aspect uh, that I'm trying to illustrate in the paper and in this talk is to get us to think a little differently about a subset of the court's affirmative action cases than perhaps we have done heretofore. The normative conclusion that I draw from what I believe to be an analysis of the real underlying issue in this subset of cases is, unsurprisingly, that I think the court has gotten it wrong, profoundly wrong, for reasons that I'll go on about at some length. The doctrinal aspect, then, the government speech portion of the title of the paper, is that I suggest that the issues the court is trying to address and rectify are better addressed under the First Amendment. And hopefully, by the time this talk is done, all of those pieces will come together. I do plan to summarize the paper in a fairly brief fashion uh, to leave more time for a dialogue and a Q&A. Uh, despite what my students might think, I'm a, a better teacher than a preacher, so I'd prefer to have a dialogue and discussion with you all than lecture uh, for all of the time that we have. Last preliminary point. There's a reason why John Stewart is up there, which we'll <laughs> get to momentarily. So the paper is titled Affirmative Action as Government Speech. As we all know, it, it's not news to any of you that issues of race remain deeply divisive in American society. And we've seen the, the growth of a movement or philosophy that many people have called post-racialism. The idea being that we have largely entered an era, an era of the end of racism. That is, that bigotry, burning crosses, and the Klan are largely gone. And if you believe that those sorts of factors are the, the cause or the primary cause of racial inequality, yet racial inequality still persists, then you would believe that any existing inequities are not due to racism, because we are post-racial, but are due to something else. That something else might be lack of individual effort, it might be differences in culture or education, et cetera. But the post-racialist view would suggest that the law should not use race to fix problems that are not racial. That's the, the underlying so supposition of post-racialism. Unsurprisingly, racial minorities, uh, particularly blacks and Latinos, tend to view the situation somewhat differently. In light of the continued disparities in, in most realms that we see with regard to people of color in terms of education, criminal justice, and those sorts of things, racial minorities tend to be more likely to ascribe those inequalities to issues of either contemporary racism or the current effects of past discrimination. The Supreme Court, as I will illustrate in a moment, has sided fairly firmly with the post-racialists in its colorblindness doctrine of equal protection. Before doing that, though, I hope to use the tool of satire to illustrate in a humorous fashion the, the mm, characterizations in their most extreme form. So this uh, clip from The Daily Show, it starts off a little slow, but the reason why I'm showing it will quickly become apparent. So let me play that and then we will continue. Oh, there's uh, profanity in this because it's The Daily Show, but I believe it's all been bleeped. <laughs> Two prominent African-American representatives in Congress are heading to separate ethics trials in the House over allegations they acted improperly. New York's Charlie Rangel faces charges he hid income and avoided taxes. And now word that California Democrat Maxine Waters Hello. may face charges for allegedly trying to help a bank seeking a bailout, a bank her husband had served as a board member. The bank did wind up getting $12 million in TARP money. $12 million in TARP money? Also known as only $12 million in TARP? Seriously, if that's all she could get out of TARP, that's not corruption, that's incompetence. <laughs> Here to discuss the story, our senior black correspondent, Larry Wilmore. Larry, thank you. Um, Larry, what do you make of this? Yes, two black members of Congress on trial for ethics violations. No worry, Maxine, stand up and do your thing, little girl. There's a lot being said about why so many black elected officials getting caught up with this new OCE organization. I think about now, or uh, recently about eight members of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, right. are being investigated and I think more to come. So people are raising questions about that. Mm-hmm. This is straight up LWB, legislating while black. <laughs> it is an outrage. We will not be silenced. John, what's wrong? You're not flinching. No. No, I'm not. 
You know, because when I bring the race stuff up, you really get uncomfortable. Yeah, this isn't really a race issue, though, Larry. It's really an entitlement and corruption issue about people who have been... No, 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 no. Long. Trust me, John. It's because they're black. Yeah, that's not flying. <laughs> it's not really flying on this one, Larry. So really? I don't, yeah, I don't Wait, think... Wait, no, 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 no. Hold on one second. That's it. What's the problem? Hmm? What is it? What do you uh, it's the race car. <laughs> What is that? I mean, no, well, that's that. Wait, let, let me try again. She. <laughs> the race car's maxed out. You have an actual race car. Don't leave home without it, John. But, but, and your actual race car has a limit. I guess so. I didn't read n Void during a black presidency. <laughs> Small print is a mother yeah. <laughs> You know, I should have seen it coming though. Look, the Congressional Black Caucus has been overusing the race car for years. Like, like when they demanded that the utterly unqualified Roland Burris be admitted to the Senate just because he's black. Or when they defended Congressman William Jefferson who got caught with $90,000 in his freezer. Well, that was actually, maybe he was planning to bake a money pot. So, <laughs> with frozen money? Please, there ain't no money pie like a fresh money pie. pie. <laughs> Obama himself, though, has played the race card. Yeah. Professor Gates then shows his ID to show that this is his house. The Cambridge police uh, acted stupidly. Yeah, and how'd that go? <laughs> See, John? What's different about Obama is he learned from the experience. Here he is last week talking about Charlie Rango. He's somebody who's at the end of his career, 80 years old. I'm sure that uh, what he wants is to be able to uh, end his career with dignity. See, he didn't play the race card. He played the old card. <laughs> there's an old card. Sure, there's all kinds of cards you use to avoid accountability. Look, John, there was a time when blacks didn't have a card. The only one out there was the master race card, all right? We didn't qualify. <laughs> So when the race card came out, yeah, we charged the shit out of that, all right? But nowadays, we've got the gay card, the Christian card, the disabled card, the ADHD card, I had bad parents card, the fat card, the I'm the only fill in the blank who works here card, the poor card. There's a poor card. Oh, yeah, fat cat McRicho didn't know that. Huh? <laughs> See, I just played it on you, John. <laughs> but you're not poor. Yeah, you just have to be poorer than the other guy. But if the race card, which was once so powerful and used by these, these black politicians, is maxed out, where does it then leave black politicians? Right, John. Safely ensconced in gerrymandered districts, which we bought with the race card. <laughs> sure, look, John, even if you threw Charlie Rangel in jail, you know who'd get elected to fill his seat? Another brother. Look at Rangel's turf. Harlem, Washington Heights. Yeah, but there's, I see a little bit of Queens in there, too, right over there on the right. Yeah, yeah, That's... yeah, yeah. And you know what that bit of Queens is called? Rikers Island, John. <laughs> I think we're safe. Thank you very much, No, Larry. wait, wait, Larry. wait, wait, hold on. Is that, that's all my time? Yeah, we got to wrap it up, and then that's the, uh, wait, the wait, end. Wait, 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 what? Oh, John Hodgman gets six minutes. A brother can't get... Uh, what? Oh, a oh, brother's a little heavy now. You put on a few pounds. And no, I... it has nothing to do with the uh, race and weight. And... Oh, what is it? That... Oh, 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 gray-haired Wilmore. Uh, this is some ageist bull <laughs> Really? Really? Ageist? Really? Nice work, Dumbledore. <laughs> <laughs> What are you, Chuck Todd's dad? You know they had cream for that, John. <laughs> Larry, one more, everybody. <coughs> All right. uh, what I really like about that clip, aside from the fact that it's really, really funny, um, is the way that it satirizes the extremes on both sides of the debate, right? For some folks, nothing is about race, even situations that are clearly racialized. For other folks, everything is about race, right? We have a division on the salience of race uh, as it currently manifests in our society. As I said before the clip, the Supreme Court, in my view, has firmly sided with the post-racialists, with John Stewart in that clip, 
and taking the position that the Equal Protection Clause must be construed in a manner that is formalistically colorblind in all circumstances. That is, regardless of whether the government action at issue aids to injure or uh, to help the lives of oppressed or historically discriminated against minority groups, they are equally constitutionally suspect. There's a difference here, though, that I think the court has perhaps purposefully uh, overlooked. It seems to me that labeling all instances of governmental race consciousness as affirmative action obscures uh, some of the differences that may be of constitutional magnitude, in my view. On the one hand, you have cases like Adirond, cases like Grutter, cases where you have a limited resource that is distributed on the presumed basis of objective merit, right? So let's take Adirond as an example. That was a case where the federal government had a financial incentive for government contractors to hire minority subcontractors in doing business with the federal government. That program was struck down as violating the Equal Protection Clause. Grutter, the University of Michigan case involving their law school, although the court did grudgingly uphold the admissions plan there, was again a situation where there was a limited resource, seats in a university, that presumably were to ordinarily be distributed on the basis of merit, yet the system of merit was subverted by considering race. Okay? As you can tell by the air quotes, I'm skeptical of that line of cases, but what I want to do for purposes of this talk is to divide them off from another category of cases that are quite different. It's possible for the government to act in a race-conscious, diversifying or remedial fashion, but not to inflict any injury on non-minorities when it does so. There are government programs, for example, <clears throat> that uh, a school board might enact to try to prevent resegregation of its public schools. The plans are race conscious in the sense that the student assignments depend, uh, if there's a tie between one student and another, on the race of the student in question. If you want to maintain the demographic diversity of your school within some rough correlative of the district as a whole, then a given student may go to school A rather than school B. The student who didn't get their first choice of school, however, is not injured, at least not in the same way as a case like Adirond or Grutter. All students in the scenario I described get to attend a public school that is functionally uh, and uh, intended to be equal in form, and there's no material, tangible, or concrete harm that one can identify in that kind of scenario. Similarly, you, you have cases where a uh, city might act in a race-conscious but non-injurious fashion by deciding not to make any promotions in its safety forces until it can decide uh, on a way to do that that is non-discriminatory to minority firefighters. If no one is promoted, then under the traditional view of equal protection, there's been no differential treatment, right? The court's jurisprudence conflates these two categories of cases and treats them both as constitutionally equivalent. What I contend in the latter case, the latter series of cases, is that the injury the court has identified and responds to is expressive in nature. It's not differential treatment on the basis of race. It's not the unfair distribution of some material resource. Rather, it is the message that is expressed by race-conscious, pro-minority, or diversifying governmental action. That message is counter to the court's preferred message. To briefly quote Justice Scalia, the time has come in the eyes of the government for us to recognize that we are just one race here, and that race is American, right? If notions of liberal individualism are the, the primary command uh, that the court is seeking to enforce, I contend, as I'll describe in more detail momentarily, that that debate about values, racial egalitarianism versus liberal individualism, is better analyzed under the doctrinal rubric of the First Amendment than equal protection. Okay? The court's colorblindness doctrine is inconsistent with its previous doctrine in a couple of important ways, and I'm going to try to summarize them fairly briefly. The first is that the doctrine itself originated in an acontextual fashion, and here's what I mean. The court's colorblindness jurisprudence, <coughs> excuse me, routinely invokes Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, in which he declared that our Constitution is colorblind. The contemporary court, <coughs> particularly its conservative uh, judges, have vested this phrase with a, an almost talismanic kind of quality. 
They deploy it fairly routinely as both a sword and a shield whenever issues of racial justice are raised. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I'm allergic to Cleveland. <coughs> Excuse me. The colorblindness doctrine then drawing on the inspiration of Justice Harlan's dissent also uh, is grounded in the, the words of those justices who adhere to it in several other aspects of, of the law and history. Uh, the first is that it's argued the colorblindness doctrine is driven by the constitutional text, right? The Equal Protection Clause says no state shall deny any person equal protection of the laws. Equal protection is a simple phrase. It means treat everyone equally, okay? Conservatives on the court have also tried to justify the pure colorblindness doctrine on the grounds of originalism, that it's what the framers meant or would have wanted. They've also relied on the, what I call the moral force of constitutional history. That is the argument that the colorblindness doctrine as it currently exists is uh, nothing less and nothing more than the culmination of the hard fought battle for civil rights in this country. It is what the lawyers in Brown and their allies advocated for and indeed it is what the Brown court held. If those civil rights advocates were not seeking absolute governmental neutrality on issues of race, what were they seeking? The thing that's interesting to me about each of those uh, justifications and the thing that ties them together and that first prompted my interest in this topic is that they're all wrong. And I mean demonstrably wrong as a matter of historical fact, not just a matter of policy, which leads me to conclude that something else is going on. I'll be brief in, in running through the rebuttals to those justifications, but uh, for example, constitutional text, equal protection means equal treatment. Justice Scalia himself has written in his book that we don't interpret constitutional provisions literally. A constitutional provision in general is meant to be read in its context to derive its meaning. <coughs> Excuse me. So to take the position that the words equal protection of the law ineluctably mean, uh, ineluctably mean formal equal treatment simply is contrary to the uh, normal methods of constitutional interpretation. The textualist argument, though, is probably not the strongest argument in favor of the colorblindness doctrine. There's also Justice Harlan's ringing dissent in the Plessy case. In order to draw the colorblindness doctrine from that dissent, though, you have to look at it in a fairly acontextual fashion. You have to divorce Harlan's statement that our Constitution is colorblind from the context in which he was making that statement. That is, a couple of decades after the end of slavery, he was concerned with the continued subjugation of African Americans that he believed the reconstructed Constitution had made illegal. So what about original intent as a justification for colorblindness? Well, that doesn't really work either. Um, there's a mountain of research that illustrates that the same folks who wrote the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments also passed a variety of race-conscious laws to benefit the former slaves. It wouldn't make sense for those folks to have created a constitution that demands absolute governmental neutrality on race and then themselves act in a race-conscious fashion. What about Brown and the arguments of the lawyers and litigators in Brown? I, I read an interesting argument that actually takes a more nuanced position on this question. It's by a professor named Christopher Schmidt. And he says it's, it's actually true that the briefs in Browns and the uh, advocacy around it did lead with a call for colorblindness in the law. But the bulk of the briefs, the bulk of the advocacy, the bulk of the strategy was dedicated toward proving that segregated schools harmed black children in a concrete and tangible way, right? That the stigmatization of segregated facilities and education interfered in a concrete manner with their educational opportunities. What about the Brown decision itself? Didn't Brown hold that regardless of concrete similarities between public facilities, that governmental color consciousness in itself always violates the Equal Protection Clause? No, it's not what Brown held. Brown held that the injury inflicted by that segregation in the context of decades and indeed centuries of slavery and apartheid was the injury not an acontextual principle of colorblindness, okay? So the, the fixation of, of the court, mainly its conservative justices, on the uh, colorblindness idea I found is particularly striking in light of the historical evidence that would tend to disprove it. 
It's also striking, and I'll be brief here, <coughs> uh, with regard to the same justices' um, rather pompous reminders regarding counter-majoritarianism and the limits of judicial action and the praise of democratically enacted policies, right? The same justices who scold uh, minorities for achieving victories in the legislative sphere that lead to, legislative sphere that lead to this kind of race conscious action <coughs> are the ones who most loudly declaim counter-majoritarian interference with the democratic process. So it is, if nothing else, hypocritical. Um, it's also inconsistent. Now, the court has been uh, pretty upfront with regard to its reasons for finding that governmental color, color consciousness violates equal protection. I'll briefly uh, discuss just one of the cases that I talk about in the paper, the uh, parents involved in community schools decision. That was the uh, Seattle and Louisville school desegregation cases from a couple of terms ago where the school boards in question adopted race conscious student assignment plans wherein a given student would be assigned to one school rather than another if the school of first choice was in danger of resegregating. Okay? The plurality opinion by the Chief Justice struck down that program and in a, a, a phrase that is, strikes me is only matched in its self-righteousness by LeBron's decision to lead the Cavs, <laughs> the Chief Justice wrote with uh, grandiosity that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, <laughs> right? Post-racialism. The plurality went on to condemn governmental race consciousness in terms that are almost indeed entirely expressive. The plurality talked about such programs as promoting values that were inconsistent with American values, reinforcing racialization, endorsing a destructive uh, worldview, and demeaning the individual students who were subject to these programs. Justice Kennedy's concurring opinion in parents involved is even more striking in this regard. <coughs> Excuse me for a moment. Justice Kennedy actually did not join the plurality in its holding that the government can never or presumptively can never consider race. For Justice Kennedy, the problem was not the existence of the race consciousness, it was the explicit expression of it through a policy that, in his words, labeled each student or typed them according to race. For Justice Kennedy, then, if the governmental action is facially neutral, it is permissible even if race conscious. His opinion and parents involved is about the expression of racialization and the fact that race still matters or that diversity is an important value rather than the consideration of it. So for Justice Kennedy, you're allowed to see the elephant in the room. You're just not allowed to talk about it, right? That's kind of the, the apotheosis of racist speech, right? No expressive injury can be inflicted unless we actually express something. <coughs> there are other cases in this pure colorblindness line that uh, I am going to skip for the sake of time. What I want to transition to, though, is pointing out the second area where the court's colorblindness doctrine is inconsistent with its previous doctrine, and that is to say this. There are a series of cases where the Supreme Court, including many of the conservative justices who most strongly uh, embrace colorblindness, have dismissed claims of race-based race expressive harms when they're made by racial minorities. Take Palmer versus Thompson, right? <clears throat> a famous Supreme Court case from the 70s. In that case, the city of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, had been sued to desegregate its public facilities. It complied and desegregated them all except for the city's swimming pools, right? They were sued. The plaintiffs alleged that the uh, city's action had violated both equal protection and the 13th Amendment because the city's action was an official expression of the worldview that blacks were so inferior, unclean, to, uh, the, to be allowed to share this kind of uh, public facility with whites. <coughs> the, the context of that message could not have been lost on the court, if for no other reason than the fact that it was in the briefs in the case, right? Mississippi was one of the strongholds of segregation. The city of Jackson itself was an initial target of the freedom rides that were intended to test the force of the Supreme Court's decision in Boynton, which held that uh, discrimination in interstate transportation was illegal. To further contextualize the message in Jackson, it's worth noting that 
one year after the lawsuit in um, Palmer was filed, Medgar Evers, who was the NAACP field secretary, was assassinated in his home by a white supremacist <coughs> named Byron De La Beckwith. Shortly after, uh, shortly after that, during the, the trial uh, for uh, Byron De La Beckwith, the former governor of Mississippi, Ross Barnett, walked into the courtroom as Medgar's widow was testifying and shook Beckwith's hand, right? That's Jackson, Mississippi in the late 60s, early 70s. It seems to me that Palmer then was a case that involved a clear text, context, and subtext. The text was clear, right? Integrating the swimming pools was a line that the city would not cross because of white residents' revulsion at sharing that type of public facility with blacks. The context, as I've talked about a moment ago, was equally clear. This was a city that was maintaining an official policy of apartheid. <coughs> Excuse me. And the subtext was clear. Blacks, because of historical prejudice, were thought to be unfit for association in intimate settings. And indeed, uh, many scholars have written that the, the semiotic function of segregation was as important to its defenders as the instrumental purposes. Despite that mountain of evidence regarding the expressive injury inflicted by the city's action, the court found no equal protection violation. Why? Because everyone was treated equally. The swimming pools were closed to everyone, right? No unequal treatment, and the court explicitly held that the expressive message of stigma sent by segregation was not constitutionally cognizable standing alone. Okay. I will, again, for the sake of time, skip the uh, remaining summary <coughs> of the earlier cases that are inconsistent with the contemporary court's pure colorblindness doctrine. To summarize, though, the court has been exceedingly skeptical of such claims when they are made by racial minorities. It has embraced with open arms such claims when they are made in challenge to policies that would tend to improve racial minorities' lives. The court's cases then adopting the pure colorblindness approach, uh, it seems to me, are about the expressive content uh, and message that is sent by race conscious government action. The pure colorblindness doctrine, I characterize it as a, uh, an embrace of the dominant narrative that we have overcome rather than the competing narrative that we shall overcome. It's a declaration that we have reached the end of that point in history rather than being engaged in a continued struggle within history. The court's value judgment, and I, I truly mean this, that the effects of considering race may do more harm than good could be correct. They could be right. One of the things that I've gone less sure of as I've gotten older is my own infallibility. The court could be right. I don't know. I don't purport to know the best solution to racial problems in America. What I do know is that if the court is seeking to uh, push the embrace of a value principle based on uh, the expressive content <coughs> of government action, then I believe a better place to analyze that is under the first amendment. Before making the turn to that part of the discussion, I, I will note briefly that I'm aware of some of the dangers and pitfalls with constitutional borrowing that is seeking to import doctrine developed in one area into another area. But I believe it's particularly appropriate here for several reasons. <coughs> Excuse me. First off, the court has already borrowed in the other direction. The court's First Amendment cases apply equal protection levels of scrutiny to content-based and content-neutral restrictions on speech. So borrowing First Amendment doctrine and applying it in the equal protection context would be doing the same thing, just in reverse. Secondly, analyzing instances of race-conscious but non-injurious treatment as government speech, it seems to me, would better reflect the reality of what the court is concerned about. As I mentioned, the court's concern is that the message sent by race conscious governmental action is in contradiction with its preferred message, whether that's characterized as anti-paternalism or liberal individualism. The court believes that the message is the harm. When we're arguing about messages and their value, the First Amendment is a natural place to go. The other reason why I think a First Amendment analysis is particularly appropriate is this. The court's 
sloganeering and platitudes about race are furthered by analyzing these kind of cases under the rubric of equal protection. What do I mean by that? If your doctrine is one under which the first person in the room to notice race is the racist, we don't have much of a discussion left to have, right? By contrast, thinking about these things as uh, dealing with the expression of competing values would allow a debate that is, to quote New York Times versus Sullivan, uninhibited, robust, and wide open. I don't know who's right, but I know that to be sure there's a debate to be had. So the last part of, of the paper and of this talk, at least the formal portion, deals with how I think the government speech doctrine could apply. First, let me explain what I mean. The government speech doctrine is actually a fairly recent innovation in First Amendment law. It flows from a fairly common sense principle. That is that the government <clears throat> sometimes has to express things in furtherance of its policies, right? Where the message is the government's own, the court has held, the government speech doctrine provides an exception to the usual rules of content and viewpoint neutrality. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? The government can establish Arlington Cemetery to honor our war dead without establishing a cemetery to honor our enemies. The government expresses things in its policies all the time, and the government speech doctrine, at least in its simplest form, seeks to recognize that. So provided that the speech is the government's own, the First Amendment requirements of content and viewpoint neutrality will not forbid the government from expressing that message. Some other constitutional provision might, but not the First Amendment. So the court's first rationale for the government speech doctrine is that the government sometimes has to speak. The second rationale, and the one that I think is even more critical for thinking about how it could apply to this scenario, is that the court has held the government speech doctrine relates to notions of democratic accountability. We apply strict judicial review whenever the government suppresses or favors private speech because we believe that that's indicative of a defect in the democratic process, right? Usually the speaker or her message is something that the government fears or dislikes. Where the government is speaking for itself and promoting its own message, there's not that same fear of a process defect with regard to accountability. Governmental messages are presumably both generated by the electorate, but even more importantly, subject to correction by that electorate, right? If you do not like your senators supporting a policy that denies federal funds being used for abortion because that senator believes abortion to be immoral and wishes to express that, then you can vote that senator out of office. We don't have the same fears of a process defect when something is characterized as government speech. There's an entire series of government speech cases that I talk about in the paper that I will spare you right now, but the upshot of them is this. The court hasn't actually developed a majority that has articulated a clear bright line rule as to when the government speech doctrine applies and when it doesn't. But it's clear that there are two things we should be looking for to ascertain whether the message is truly the government's own and therefore the doctrine applies. One would be whether the public acting reasonably would perceive the government to be expressing its own message rather than endorsing private speech. The second is whether, in fact, the government established and controlled the message. Okay? Some justices prefer the former principle, some justices prefer the latter. But surely, if both are present, most of the justices would find the government speech doctrine to apply. So how does all that apply to what I call the pure colorblindness cases? That is, where the court strikes down race-conscious but non-injurious governmental action. The first thing to note, and although I dwell on it at some length in the paper, I won't do it here, is that government action can, not must, but can be considered a form of expressive conduct. Okay? The First Amendment, of course, only refers to uh, abridgments of speech, but the court has recognized expressive conduct, and indeed in its government speech cases has recognized government action as a form of expressive conduct sometimes. Of course, we have a multifactorial test that we must apply to figure it out. The second point is that it, it's useful to, to, I guess, make explicit that it's not at all unusual for government action to have a, an expressive or indeed primarily an expressive component. If you think about laws running a spectrum from, say, running a red light, which really has only instrumental purposes, to the Cleveland City Council deciding that it will only allow Christian displays in public square, 
There's a variety of governmental action that will fall closer to the former and therefore not be considered expressive conduct and also government action that will fall closer to the latter. So what we're looking for uh, with regard to expressive conduct has both a, a subjective and an objective dimension, both of which we apply in context. We look to see whether the government is attempting to express something, whether the listeners would catch that something that is expressed in the context in which the action takes place. Thinking about expressive conduct with regard to, let's stick with parents involved, we would ask whether the school boards were expressing <coughs> excuse me, a message when they adopted their policies aimed at preventing resegregation. It seems to me that pretty clearly they were. The expressive dimension may not have been the only factor, but it was clearly a motivating factor. Indeed, the Seattle School Board fairly explicitly, and, and let me read the quote, said that it pursued these policies because it believed that the emphasizing of individualism as opposed to a more collective ideology is a form of cultural racism and that the district had no intention of uh, adhering to a colorblind mentality. The court cited that language in Parents Involved as a reason why <coughs> the government action was unconstitutional because it expressed a notion that was contrary to liberal individualism. So could it be considered expressive conduct? I believe so. Could it be considered government speech? We would have to think about whether those sorts of policies are intended to express a message, as I said, and whether the public would likely receive the message that the speaker is attempting to convey. I argue uh, at great length that in all three of the major colorblindness cases that I address in this paper, that the government indeed should have had the benefit of the government speech doctrine. In closing, let me say this in order to leave time for a discussion. As I noted earlier, the, the worldview that race no longer matters, I think is rational. It might be more than rational, it, it might be correct. And it, it's certainly laudable as a matter of our aspirations. My point is not necessarily that that is wrong as a moral matter. My point is that that is not a worldview that the Constitution requires the government to share. The Supreme Court is perfectly entitled to hold that view, but there is nothing in the Equal Protection Clause, in my view, that commands that other government entities do as well. So thank you all for your attention. <clears throat> And I'd be happy to have a discussion. Okay, but do we have folks holding the, are there mics here because we are being webcast? <coughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, this goes to show why you should never let me around either technology or anything that relates to keeping piles balanced, although some of you who've been to my office um, may wonder about that. Um, so let's let's take some let's take some questions for uh, for a bit and Chip, you've been here before, so let me let you run the show. Okay, please. Um, yes, please. All the way in the back, sir. Professor, have you gone through the exercise <coughs> of this revisiting history? If the court had applied the analysis you proposed, would it have made any difference? Yeah, I do. Um, in the paper itself, I do, and I plan to expand it further. Um, I believe there are cases where applying the government speech paradigm would clearly lead to a different result like parents involved, okay? There are other cases where I'm actually not sure, and I, I think one of the indications of a good theory is that it doesn't just work in your ideological favor, right? Um, so let me use the example of uh, Ricci versus De Stefano, which was the New Haven firefighters case from a couple of terms ago, or just last term. I characterize that as a case that's in this vein of uh, the injury being purely expressive. After all, no one was promoted, no firefighters got the promotions, Therefore, under the court's traditional precedence, we wouldn't think about it in equal protection terms. Now, Ricci was decided under Title VII, but the decision had a heavy, heavy equal protection overlay, right? I am not sure that the uh, doctrinal shift that I propose actually would have changed the result, and here's why. One of the underlying principles of the government speech doctrine is transparency as it relates to democratic accountability. 
We don't worry as much when the government is expressing its own messages because we think they're subject to correction, right? But they're only subject to correction if the, it is transparent that the government was pr expressing its own message as opposed to endorsing a private message. The reason why I say Ricci, I'd have to think about a little bit further under the doctrine is this. For Justice Alito's, uh, for those of you who have read his opinion, the biggest problem was that he believed that the democratic process had been illegitimately captured by this scary black pastor in New Haven, right, who had somehow managed to mow mow the mayor into adopting this hardcore black power pro-minority point of view. As you can tell by the sarcasm, I think he's wrong, right? Uh, but if members of the court believe that's what happened, it would tend to undercut the transparency and democratic accountability rationale of the government speech doctrine. That answer your question? Please, sir. Yes. <coughs> yes. Um, a few years ago, two gentlemen won the Nobel Prize for economics on their writings that slavery was economically efficient, especially as it, relate, it related to labor, because they had a 100% profit margin. Uh, fast forwarding, um, I view affirmative action as equal footing. Uh, my question to you is, a few, uh, George Bush Sr. went to Japan to talk to the Japanese about international affirmative action because the United States wanted equal footing in the car market. And as it relates to the government, what is your opinion on the government being able to uh, recognize affirmative action internationally, but not being able to recognize or deal with it nationally? Sure, yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar with the specific examples you mentioned, but if what we mean by affirmative action when we use that term pejoratively is that we have somehow undercut the otherwise uh, presumably objective system of merit, then any instance in which one seeks to gain an advantage because of who you are rather than what you've done, which is how the opponents characterize affirmative action, is doing the same thing. But it, it's not expressing the same message, right? So for purposes of my analysis, the message the court condemns is the belief that race still matters. Why is that such a condemnable message uh, that the court believes it violates equal protection? Both because it addresses the wrong problem, the problem is no longer race under this worldview, but also because it injures non-minorities by uh, unfairly depriving them of something to which they were entitled. It expresses to them the worldview that they are not, and because this is being recorded, I'm going to be cautious in what I am about to say, are no longer entitled to have permanent dominance, right? That's the message it expresses, that the government does not believe that the natural order of things is for whites to persistently be in a position of dominance for all time. That is the message that the court is condemning. So I think it's actually a little different from the examples you raise in that sense, but obviously uh, related. Does anybody want to take a pot shot at me? I want to refine this before I send it out for publication, so I'd appreciate critiques and comments. Hi, yeah. Professor. Hi. Um, you focus mostly on um, free speech. Yes. Have you thought <clears throat> about looking at this through freedom of association? Is it possible to do so under I, that I haven't. Why do, why do you think of that? I'm just thinking of like the NAACP versus Alabama cases, and that was a freedom of association. And then just thinking of affirmative action on its own and thinking that minorities can fit into a certain group because they have the right to do so. Yeah. Have you thought about that at all? Yeah, um, I have in a, in a tangentially related way. So here's the next paper, okay? <laughs> if I'm right that the court is condemning race conscious, diversifying or remedial governmental action that doesn't inflict a tangible harm because of its expressive content, okay? Then my point here is that the court should stop doing that, right? The second paper is this, though. If that's actually what's going on, then couldn't a private employer raise a First Amendment defense and or the uh, employees who would be benefited by the action? I haven't thought about it in freedom of uh, association terms, but I've thought of it as the private employer raising uh, freedom of expression defense when it's sued, right? The argument would be that enforcing a judgment against me that prohibits me from expressing my racial egalitarian worldview violates my right to free speech. I obviously haven't thought it out very long, but I'll send you a copy when it's done. <laughs> yeah. Other thoughts? Please. Uh, is there a 
an ideal fact pattern for you that would uh, enhance your doctrinal view as opposed vis a vis the Supreme yeah. Court's current view on color blindness? Um, ideal in what sense? That it would fall within this government speech idea? Uh, most clearly Mm. That would most clearly indicate where I think the court has gone wrong. Yeah, I actually think that case has parents involved, um, which I'm still not over, by the way. It came down three, four years ago. I'm not over it yet. Um, the, the decision, I think, actually is paradigmatic in this sense. Think about what happened. The school boards had a plan. They said, here are the demographics of our district. We're aware that due to white flight and other circumstances, given uh, school buildings might be in danger of falling way out of line with the overall demographics of our district. We think that's bad for instrumental reasons because green follows white, that is schools that have larger white populations tend to perform better. And number two, we think it's bad normatively. We think that in order to learn to live together, we must first learn together. Okay. So the school board said we will, after first considering a list of other factors, assign students possibly based on their race when a particular school building is getting out of whack with the overall demographics of our jurisdiction. What were the potential injuries there? It can't be that student A who was sent to another school because student B was sent to the school of first choice has to drive a little bit further. There's a case called Memphis versus Green where the court completely dismissed that when that claim was made by racial minorities. It's de minimis. It's a mere inconvenience. It's trivial. So what are the other concrete injuries that occur? The court accepted, for the sake of argument, that the school buildings were <coughs> and were intended to be substantially equivalent. So the injury is the expression of the message that having a diverse school is a social value that matters more than your individual choice of your first school. So in that sense, I see it as paradigmatic because I don't see a tangible injury. I see the expressive one. John. <coughs> um, All right, this is the question I was hoping wouldn't happen. Okay, <coughs> uh, okay. okay. sorry about that. Um, if we take the, the premise to be that when the, when the Seattle School Board, for example, says, we think that the community and our students will be better off if they learn together, why couldn't the school board in Topeka, Kansas, or Prince Edward County, Virginia, or Clarendon County, yep. South Carolina, uh, or Wilmington, Delaware, have said, we think that the community will be better off and the students Mm -hmm. will be better off and that maybe they'll even learn more if they're in separate schools. Why couldn't the government then be in the position of saying, this, the school board saying, this is government speech, this mm -hmm. is our message. Mm -hmm. And one response might be uh, that as segregation was practiced at that time, the separate schools were inherently unequal, although in Topeka mm -hmm. they were only marginally mm -hmm. different. But on your theory, had the school boards argued this government speech approach, does Brown come out differently? Yeah. So here's the thing. Um, I actually have a response to that. That possibility bothers me less with regard to the, to the Brown analogy than it does with regard to another category of cases where my theory might be troubling for what I substantively believe to be just. Um, the answer that I try to lay out in the paper is in, indeed not only could the school boards in the Old South have made they, these arguments, they did. Right? They argue that because of the racial tension in our community that our children will not learn well together. Integrating them will be a net harm for everyone. Right? They made that argument. My best response, um, although it falls a little bit along the line of my history is better than your history, so I want to refine it a little bit more, but my best response is that in a situation like parents involved, there's no constitutional injury by that message because it, the message is not one that is grounded in centuries of subordination, stigmatization, and apartheid. Now, I understand that folks on the other side of the fence may say, well, it's equally injurious to keep talking about race as it was in Brown. Um, I, I just don't think that it's true. I just don't think that it, it holds up to scrutiny. I'll briefly mention, though, the category of cases that does bother me. 
where there are claims that are, are made by minorities or uh, other uh, people who have been discriminated against in the past, where the court has rejected those claims like Palmer, saying there's been no unequal treatment, you're fine. Right? And it's arguably equivalent to what I'm arguing folks are doing today with the best of intentions. Uh, the way I've tried to reconcile it, at least inside my own head, is that unlike the conservative majority on the court, I believe we can tell the difference between government action that is intended to harm and government action that is intended to help. Wait, let me. Had an interesting case once where a um, company did not get a public contract, and they alleged that the reason they did not get a public contract was because they had an all-white worker. And that wasn't really the reason why they did not get the contract, but that was their allegation. Um, and there was a policy in place that this entity would look at the, the makeup of the workplace of the different bidders and they had some kind of soft goals sure. uh, that were easily, you know, easily escaped simply by explaining why you had no minorities in your workforce. And in this case, this entity would have uh, easily passed. Now imagine flipping it so that it's not that you don't get a contract if you have a racially segregated workplace, but if you have a more diverse workplace, you get an extra. Mm -hmm. Two percent on top of sure. the contract. Sure. Like yeah, it's Adirond in reverse. It, and I guess I, I see the. It's one thing for government to have a policy in favor of diversity, and to say you're not going to get a contract because you do not have a diverse workplace. It's another thing to say. To, to flip it and say we're going to do this as a bonus. You're going to get something extra mm -hmm. if you do. We're not going to discriminate against the first entity by saying they cannot bid on the contract, mm -hmm. but if this other entity has a more diverse workplace, you get something a little bit extra. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure that this first group would have lost anything sure. um, because they would still have gained the contract under those, under those circumstances. It's just that a different bidder with a more diverse workplace would have had an advantage against them. Uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is it's one thing for government to have a point of view. Uh, the real problem comes when the rubber hits the road and how you're taking that point of view and actually implementing it in a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Uh, and, and putting some real, and when you start divvying up goods and start divvying up money sure. and deciding who will benefit and who won't. Benefit. Sure, although under my theory, I've tried to cabin off cases like Adirond and Gruder and this scenario from the cases that I'm most concerned with, right? Because I'm willing to concede for the sake of this immediate argument that where we have an unequal distribution of some tangible resource like money, and that distribution is based uh, in part on race, then doing a utilitarian calculus under the Equal Protection Clause where we value, uh, balance costs versus benefits makes sense to me, right? But in a scenario where there is uh, not that type of tangible, concrete, material harm or otherwise differential treatment, we're not doing tangible cost-benefit balancing. What we're balancing are values as expressed. So that's my first response. Uh, my second response is this. Um, why wouldn't that be like the federal government, as in Rust versus Sullivan, deciding to only give its money to folks who don't perform abortions? Right? It's the same thing. That was the first government speech case in this line of, of doctrine. So, you know, um, putting aside my first point, the government can't selectively fund things uh, if it is doing so to express its own message. Mr. Adler. Yeah, I, my question is, you surprised me with your answer to uh, Professor Atten's question about Brown, because I would have thought the answer that the injury in, in Brown is, it, while there was an expressive component to it, was more than expressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we put it in due process terms, it's, stigma, it's not just stigma alone, it's stigma plus. That, mm -hmm. that Yes, there was all the stigmatization, but given the history and the context, whenever segregation was a tool of racial subordination and would have been so even if the message was somehow silent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and, and, agree. But okay. My question, though, is I'm, I'm wondering about how successful you are at characterizing parents involved and some of these other cases as being fundamentally 
solely about expressive injury in a way that's, that, say, the affirmative action cases are not. So, mm -hmm. for example, Alan Bakke couldn't prove he would have gotten in to the University of California. Mm -hmm. he, all he could prove was he didn't get to compete for the however many spots. Mm -hmm. The plaintiffs in Michigan couldn't prove they would have gotten in. Um, all they could prove is that, that were it not for the consideration of race, their possibilities were different. Right. It seems to me the, child, the children and parents involved can't prove they would have gone to, that, gone to the other school. But the, the physical distribution uh, or the distribution of a good, spots in particular schools, was changed because of race. And so it seems to me that, that if, if Bakke and Gruder and Gratz involve more than expressive injury, I'm not sure how, you, how parents involved or even, even Richie, which arguably involves a changing of the rules after the game had begun mm -hmm. as opposed to um, uh, 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 you know, not letting the game start or starting the game under different rules. Sure. I'm not sure how, how you keep those in a pure expressive injury box. Sure. Let me um, offer a brief response, although I'd be interested in talking about it more. The first one is that unlike Gratz or Gruder or Adirondack or Baki, seats in a public school are not a limited resource, right? All of the schools were presumed to be substantially equivalent in terms of their academic programs. Every child got a seat in the school. Alan Baki didn't get a seat. Two, to take the court at its word, or at least the words that I'm inferring from the words that it says, the problem it has is with the subversion of what it sees as the more just system of individual merit that should decide who gets what benefits and who does not. Assigning school children is not a merit-based decision, right? We don't send you to school A because you're a better violin player, unless it's a charter school or something like that. It's just not the same kind of decision, so therefore there's not the same alleged subversion. Now, Ricci, I think, is trickier. Right? I think it's true in Ricci that they were not, the disappointed firefighters, right? not actually entitled to promotion. Scoring well on the test at issue in Ricci did not entitle them to be promoted. It did entitle them to be considered. And in that sense, it feels closer to your analogy to, to Baki and to Gruder. Okay? I, yeah, I am uh, probably supposed to stop now. <laughs> One more question? Uh, you don't really have time. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let me, if I could, just say one last thing. Um, I didn't say this at the beginning because I didn't want to go all Glenn Beck on you. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's good to be home uh, and have this group of people here to support this talk. And so thank you all again. Thank you.